Hello, this is Tony Ballinger from the Fighting Men of Rhodesia YouTube series. It's my pleasure today to have Roger Finch on board. He was a dispatcher in the Air Force. And um, before we go into Roger's story, I would just like to thank him for responding to the appeal of coming on board to give his story. Uh, I, I just want to emphasize how difficult it is to get hold of people to talk. And this channel depends on you. There's still many thousands of you out there that have not told your story. And it's not just army personnel or men that we're looking uh, to for stories. We, we want uh, stories from farmers, from civilians that experience difficult times, from national parks people, lady and the, ladies in the WVS. You've all got a story to tell. So I want to encourage you to please, please come forward. It's not a, a live um, recording. We do it uh, behind the scenes. If you fluff it up, we just start again. So having said that, uh, Roger, thank you very much for responding to an earlier appeal and um, it's over to you if you can just give us a background of where you came from and who you are and how you got into the military hi thanks thanks for your your time uh, in doing this series um it, it it's it's really entertaining formative um brings back great uh, memories as well as seeing old friends that, mm -hmm. that you don't actually get to see because you're um, you know all over the world now. Um, I'm from Bulawayo. I was born there with one sister. Uh, my parents were well. My mom was born in uh, Nyasaland Land, and uh, my dad in Bulawayo. They, both their parents were out from the UK. My dad's grandmother, I mean mother, her mother and uh, father came out from uh, what was then called Pr Prussia. And they came out and started uh, uh, Frankfurt, down in the Free State, by the Vaal River. Frankfurt, they were early kind of settlers there. And then they upped and in 1895, took the uh, docks wagons to uh, Bulawayo, set up there. Um, my gran was a month or two old. And um, yeah, they, they, they built a house in Bulawayo. Uh, great grand was was the first midwife there, and um, yeah, it uh, from there she had my grand had two two sons, my dad and his brother. Brother unfortunately passed away at a very early age. Um, all now buried together in Bulawayo, and um, then I came along and and my sister a year before me. Yeah, we uh, grew up in Bulawayo. I went to uh, Hamilton High with the um, Illustrious Bushni twins. <laughs> I think George had already uh, uh, <laughs> left. And um, I started my apprenticeship. Uh, my dad was a toolmaker on the railways. And then I also started my apprenticeship there with uh, in instrumentation. Became an instrument tech. And uh, I uh, thought, sure, I'm out of school. That's great. That is, you know, you long hair, earning cash. You're, you're away. Yeah. <laughs> I need to find out within three months that they sent me to college and college was double what school was. So instead of eight to one, now I'm eight to five. Your reports from college went to the apprenticeship board, your employer, your parents, and one to yourself. So it was a lot stricter, uh, especially the, the, the epi, epi officer coming around to, uh, in, to, to, to get all the of of epis who weren't weren't satisfactory, um, yeah, and I had a really brilliant time there. Um, uh, I did myself in in the academic academic section purely because of of the the, the Rhodesian system. We got uh, hourly bonus for each exam we passed, external exam, which were all marked in the UK, mm. and then um, I uh, I liked that, and then. Mm. Yeah, so I kept I kept going and I took extra extra classes in uh, heavy power and all sorts of things, and then uh, eventually, well, that that actually, you know, if you got your call ups, you just got deferred because they didn't want to disrupt your your education. And once I finished that, uh, you know, straight away, obviously, national service uh, called, and I went in in the beginning of seventy nine, which I was actually fairly well, very old. Uh, for an uh, uh, a national service chap. Uh, I went in when I was 21. And 
we went to Cranbourne, Cranbourne Barracks, uh, where we assembled outside on the sports field. And right around us, they had all the um, units at uh, Guard Force, Sioux Scouts, SAS, obviously RLI were taking. And they, they gave us a lecture. They, uh, Gray Scouts, come, everyone. And uh, they gave us a lecture about, you know, which, what type of uh, activities Air Force wanted and what type of, you know. And, um, you know, most of the guys were, were running for, uh, well, once they said, okay, fine, who wants to go to RLI? Uh, big, you know, I love a lot right there. But one of the early ones was uh, in the Air Force, they were looking, they, they didn't tell us really what, 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 was, what was needed, but they needed armorers, and all sorts of those. And then the one section they said parachuters. You need, you know, you have to be able to, you know, want to parachute. But and I thought, no, that's great. That is the real deal. And I ran off there. And um anyway, off we went to New Serum. And I remember on the in the in the bus, one of the officers there said, Oh no, you should be okay at New Serum, maybe the only person that'll Give me trouble is uh, W.O. Jackman. And uh, <laughs> true to his word, yes, W.O. Jackman was hell. Um, we, did our, we did our basic training, but because it's 79, the, the ward heated up. They, they didn't want to concentrate too much on the drill, drill square, that kind of stuff. They really wanted to get, get people out there. They, they needed they need men out there. Um, so we were fairly lucky. After first phase, we all split up and went to the de various uh, divisions that we were meant for. I went to parachute training school, PTS. Uh, PTS staff were mainly uh, from the SAS, regulars from the SAS. That was good. The uh, boss in, in charge was uh, Derek, squadron leader de Kock. Derek de Kock. Um, he, <laughs> he was crazy, sure. And um, the first thing he did is get us all together and give us one hell of a lecture on how we're going to behave here, perform, what's expected of us. And, and really, he scared the shit out of us. Um, but I remember one word, one, one of his words was, and in the same breath, you can also tell me I don't like your operation, yeah, and, and disappear. So I thought, oh, okay. And being, a, being an instrument tech, I looked across the way and the instrument room was there. And I thought, whoa, I went to that quick chat. And they said, yeah, you know. Uh, so anyway, I thought, no, nah, man, I've got myself a job here in the instrument room. Next next day, I, I, I arrived at the instrument room for duty. And and uh, two minutes later, squadron leader de Kock pulled in there. And he gave them hell. And he said, get your ass out of here now. <laughs> get, get your PT kit on and join them. So, you know. I ran for it. Um, so our first week comprised of, well, he did me, sorry, just to interrupt there, he did me the biggest favor of my life, getting me back on, on track. And um, uh, what they've done is they've brought a sergeant back from, from the bush specifically to, to train us uh, or put us through PT for, for a selection before we'd even start our training. They didn't just start, start the training and uh, weed out uh, Chaps who were unsuit unsuitable, um, and he put us through hell for for a week, and then at the end of the week he lined us all up and said, "Right, fine, you out, you out, you out." Um, so we lost we lost uh, around about a third, I think, of the guys. Um, they went to parachute packing and safety equipment department. Anyway, and uh, the rest of us now would. would Get to start our para course, basic para course, with uh, other troops. We trained for for a good week on the on the basic course before jumping, and that entailed uh, the harnesses and the swings. Uh, what you know, how how you would march towards the door in the in the mocker, uh, and jump out onto the mats at the big queer mats there, and then you had the oh, what was like a trapeze with a harness where they swung you right up in the hangar, and then the fan. Now, the fan was, was quite a scary one because you went up the top of the top of the hangar, and it was just a couple of paddles, a cable around your harness, 
handle attached to your harness, you had to jump. And they wanted you to jump out with so much force um, out the plane. So they said, right, fine. You're going to have to hit your helmet on that beam. But to hit your helmet on that beam, you had to hurl yourself face first, looking up at the beam. And just trust that you weren't going to smash your face or your teeth out or whatever it was. Um, being, a, being a shorty, a short guy, uh, we had three three uh, sessions at it. And the first two, I didn't uh, manage to hit my head. The tall guys, they did. We had a, a basic course of Sulu Scouts with, with as well. And um, they also, they got some some guys who managed to hit the hit the beam. Then I remember the sergeant Predagost said, "Okay, Barrel." They they actually called me Barrel because uh, <laughs> they liked the way I when I hit the mats, the way I rolled. They they just looked oh, look at that Barrel, and and so it was always a case of you know when you when you get known, you know your name always gets called first. So it was always a thing where roll out the Barrel, and I used to come running. Um, anyway, and I managed somehow to actually hit that beam with the helmet. And come down and uh, yeah, the roar because that was nine of us hit the beam, and of the scouts, only four hit the beam. So we were like, you know, really. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Anyway, we went into the first jump, really, really pumped up. Sergeant said to me, Right, Beryl, I want you to be the first out. And I said, No, no, no. I don't, I don't think I don't think so. I'll go second, and, and then I said, "Okay, fine, I'll go first. He said, "No, too late for you," you know. And that also taught me a lesson: don't hesitate ever, because yeah. you'll be lost. Yeah. So I, 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 I regret that. But anyway, we had our first jump. First jump was at a thousand foot, and uh, and it was it was great. I, I loved it. You looked out; it was so quiet, so you floated. Until 50 foot where you got the ground rush. Anyway, and then um, the second jump, the next day, I was in state. And a lot of guys were in state because now you know what's coming. The, the force of the engine and prop wash at the door, it actually made a bit of a wall. I, I don't think you could have fallen out that door if you tried because you really had to force yourself out. And then it could really rip and take you under the tail. Anyway, and I thought to myself, well, hey, um, a couple of guys bailed out after that first jump, and I thought, no, shoot, I can't. If I'm in this kind of state on the third jump, I'm not going to kind of thing. But I, but second jump went well, and then I, I really enjoyed it and loved it so, and stuff. And uh, we came, I think it was around about our sixth jump. So we, we dropped in altitude down to 500 foot. We were jumping there, there at Serum on runway 32, uh, grass runway, yeah. uh, just, just uh, off the loop road around. And uh, they drop us, generally depend on the wind, over in Kutsaga, the uh, tobacco experimental farm. Yeah. And we drift over and land on 3-2. And um, this, one, this one happened to be a 500-foot jump, but with full kit, rifle, webbing, yeah. bricks in the webbing, water bottles full, and a container. Yeah. Two, two ammunition containers filled with rocks welded together in your, your what they call a CSP, CSP uh, a harness which was hooked to your to your uh, your harness with quick release hooks. Once you once you were out, you your first thing was to look up, check your canopy was okay. Next, pull your fold your uh, pull your, your legs back well from the knee from the knee, bend your knee and get the legs out, your feet out the way. Hit the quick release hooks. It would drop down 15 foot uh, on a rope and. That's how you landed. Um, so I jumped and I, you know, I couldn't, the, the, the lift webs had twisted around me and I couldn't look up to check my canopy. And I thought, well, yeah, I must have bad twists, really bad. And um, if I, I tried and I felt like I was getting turned inside out. So I thought, no, quick, it's only at 500 foot. I'm quite loaded. Drop the, drop the container and then look up. So I dropped the container, and with that jerk on the end of the line, what had happened is I had a, a thing called a BP, a, a blown periphery, where your lines usually go that way up to your canopy. Now they went that way over the canopy. So it all it looked like a, basically a twisted-up balloon. Yeah. 
and I was hurtling in, and I looked up and I saw that, and uh, because the, the, the what happened is when I dropped the container and it jerked like that, it blew all the lines off the canopy. In doing that, it also ripped the canopy to pieces, and I looked up and saw this, these all these holes and yeah. So the first thing I did is I looked down and I just saw like Lieutenant Milligan and the medic running from the ambulance because I was coming in fast uh, to the left and I, I didn't even have time to pull my reserve. It was just, it was with that weight and, and 500 foot in the way, I'd, I'd, I couldn't check the canopy and by the time the lines were blew, blown off and then I looked and then I, I accelerated. Anyway, fortunately for me, I, I came in at a high rate to the left, not straight down and i um, Damaged my right heel. I cracked the, the bone in the heel, and mm. anyway, mm -hmm. but I, I was okay. They they gave me trouble about not pulling my shoot, my reserve, and everything. I just said, sir, that was anyway. Uh, the rest of the afternoon was off. So you, when you jumped in the morning, you got off from around about half past one, two o'clock for the rest of the day. I went back and went to sleep. Awake, woke up, and I was in agony with with this heel. So I went to the uh, the hospital. They didn't have anyone other than a, a, a orderly. So he gave me these painkillers. He said, don't fly. Don't take one four hours before flying. So yeah, oh, yeah. okay, got it. Took them and they worked well. But uh, I, I was walking on the, on the ball of my foot on my right leg or right foot, but also making sure that no one could see. Well, hopefully no one could see because the thought of, of, of being off the course at an early stage I knew what was coming. I was going to to safety equipment, with, and then pack parachutes and, or, or something like that. I was I was okay, but we had the entire next day off, so I um, <clears throat> I had time to rest and try and recover. But I went to sleep in the afternoon, and we had a night jump. That was the night jump. We had to be back in the hangar at Opus Five, and uh, I went to sleep. I woke up, and I was in agony, and I was so I just took two of these painkillers. And off I went up to the, the hangar. And yeah, and we took off. It, got, it was dark. And uh, I'll never forget you know, the, 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 the lights at the, at the door, the, the red and the green. You don't realize at night how bright they really are. Well, that time I, I was like, you know, Salisbury's lights. And, oh, I enjoyed it. And um, anyway, I was number one in the the third stick because it's two sticks, two sticks, and then once that side of the plane had gone, I turned and went. But when I hit the door, I, I, I missed the door and hit the side of the, like that, and I went back up, tried to go again, and I hit that side. They grabbed me, pulled me up like that, the dispatcher, and then I just kind of like fell out, <laughs> and uh, my head just about. And uh, anyway, I loved it. I had a soft landing. Everything was great. And um, yeah, we did our, did our course. From there, we started our dispatchers course. There, we were joined by a couple of TFs. Right, so bef before you carry on, um, this is a bit of a stupid question. I'm sort of asking it out of ignorance. You, you were doing all of this in the event that, as a dispatcher, your plane might be shot down or get into mechanical trouble and you have to bail out. Is that the reason you trained to, to do parachuting? Yeah, well, you couldn't. Yeah, it would be a bit embarrassing working at uh, 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 being a member of PTS and you couldn't jump or didn't know how to jump. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, the, 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 the staff at P, PTS, as I said, mostly were SAS. Uh, Director Cocker just moved on and we're uh, in charge now with uh, squadron leader Hales, Frank Hales. Um, and, and, and they were extremely proud. And when we had to show, Everyone, the parachute school, they were proud. Uh, so yeah, when when we were not not on fire force, our, our main our main duty was fire force. That's it. And we came off once once we're serum, then we'd jump every day with the troops, and we had to prepare uh, uh, all the shoots and and all that kind of stuff. So you've got to make sure once you're dispatcher that the troops have kitted up correctly. They haven't put the static lines through their body bands. They haven't put put the the, the harness straps over the, the front. Got things back to front. In, uh, you name it. In, in the heat of the moment and, and the 
fear that the, the, the guys used to have. If you don't jump for a while, you really get nervous and, and, and that. So everything happens and goes wrong. So you needed to know that inside out, you need to know every single possible thing that could happen. Mm. Um, and you would have to be a really, really efficient. We, so much so that if you weren't, if you weren't immac- jumping immaculately, that's it, you, you're out of there. You had to set an example to the troops, especially when you're at at, um, at base and and you tra- and you're helping with the uh, basic courses because they were they were they were moving basic courses through there, uh, second to none by that uh, time. And uh, yeah, you really had to know what you're doing and, and what what's going on, and and not only that, be be really good at it. Um, and they were extremely polished. When I mean polished. Us, well, just about, in fact, not just about, all our forces were, but um, parachute school, they took particular, paid particular attention to their staff and, uh, you know, and, and, and how to train, train guys going out the plane. Because trust me, they, we had accidents, yeah, a fair amount of accidents. So we had to train the troops and make sure that um, they knew everything and and they could see us do it we would go and so when we were in uh serum we would jump with them as well we would prepare all the shoots the night before uh a lot of shoots because sometimes there were two lifts so once you you uh progress in your in your course then you would jump the deck would land you'd get new shoots jump again and we'd also jump with them and watch everything that, that goes on yeah, there was one or two guys that actually got got um, very nervous, and they were gone quite quickly um, from us. Even though they did qualify, um, they just never had anyone with a bit of doubt in them who wasn't physically able and fit and strong and awake, uh, basically on top of the game. Um, because the fire forces, as as I, I was going through my my flying book, and we went out. Uh, well, I'll get to that a bit later. But yeah, that's that's why we were um, we, we were uh, para trained. Um, also, also, uh, yeah, definitely that uh, there were many occasions that the deck took rounds uh, coming into Shibani. It took rounds uh, through both fuel tanks. The first time I ever experienced that because you know you hear a large. Cut uh, allowed, katang, katang. Who's hitting this? Thing? Oh, I look out right next to me as <laughs> rounds have come through. So both sides were, were punctured. The fuel was pouring out. Uh, so I said to our pilot, hey, so we, we've, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've, I know we've taken rounds because one came through here yeah, and hit my seat and went out the side. Uh, and we managed to just come straight into Shibani. Uh, so, yeah, there was there was times uh, night ops that were clandestine. We, you know, the pilot, you know, he the the radio beacons you couldn't you couldn't navigate by them or anything like that. So they used to take a few routes. There was a, tra- a train line they used to follow until they started putting anti aircraft guns on on the, the the carriages. And by mistake, a at late at night would fly over a camp, and You'd see these red dots down there. We used to take, we used to enjoy ourselves hanging out the door looking. Ah, oh, yeah, the red dots, uh, because uh, those were actually traces. And those red dots do, soon came past your ears. <laughs> and said, so, so you, you got it all wrong uh, to the pilot. But anyway, our training, what we, we did our dispatchers course training, um, a few of us were weeded, weeded out. We had a RAR. Uh, basic course that we were pre- uh, learning our dispatching skills, and um, one of the uh, well at the start of, of their jump, uh, the guy refused to stand in the door. A trooper called him Gundu. Gundu, I was on the ground watching, and the plane was coming past, and I'm like, "Hang on, where where are the guys? Where are the guys? What happened is Gundu refused, and he and he they couldn't get him out. They couldn't get him." To stand in the door, and the next thing he just ran out the door. But the dispatcher there, that the, the trainee on our course, he had his arm through Ngundu's body belt. So you had Ngundu fly out the door, the dispatcher fly out the door, 
and uh, Ngundu banging on the side of the plane with the dispatcher's arm stuck in the, in the harness. And uh, yeah, eventually, somehow he managed to get his arm out of the body bent and Ngundu and, and the rest of the guys came down, but really late. Uh, that, that chap, uh, that, that uh, guy was on our course, didn't even see or talk to anyone. He was put, put on a, in a landy. The pl plane landed to pick up the next uh, lot of shoots and stuff on the next jump. That guy was in the landy, gone. We never ever saw him again. And that's that's the, that's the way the, the PTS guys operated. They they refused to have any any kind of uh, mistakes. Safety was was paramount. Uh, troops, we had a few refusals um, in in basic courses, and the the thing is once. Once the fear starts and spreads, it spreads like wildfire. You, a lot of the time, you can smell the fear. It, it, it's a strange feeling, but you can actually smell it. And if, it, if a, a trainee refuses to jump, you have to quickly take him up, uh, up the front, put him in the uh, flight techs uh, seat, strap him in, lock him in, basically, uh, and at the same time, try not let any other troops uh, see this. When the plane lands, he's gone. He he's he doesn't get to. No one gets to see him. Um, and that that went for, for yeah, that went for everyone. So we completed that. We yeah, very pleased with ourselves. And then um, our main job was uh, fire force duties around there, and then whatever operations. That they would pull a fire force out out of out of the 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 FAF or their field uh, for um, my first trip. So after three months in in camp, my first trip went to uh, Mount Darwin, and we landed Darwin, and uh, within half hour. So we, I'd never been in a a, a real live situation uh, uh, action. Uh, I was with we were with two commander. Orla to commander, and um, half an hour after landing, we were out uh, on a on a contact, um, and yeah, the guys, yo, it, it was big panic. Now we were we were fresh. Once you start going, once once you once you get going, the the kind of uh, uh, tension in the in the plane, everyone wants to get out, and and the pushing from behind, so they they go out. Fast. There's hardly, hardly a. There's not even a half a second between between the troops, and um, I'll never forget. I just saw this one guy. Yeah, he came down the plane, turned, and straight out the door. And this guy didn't have, even have time to turn because of the of the guys trying to get out. And he he missed the door and went straight through the the, the door in the back into the toilet. And and we. <laughs> Anyway, managed to, as the last two guy uh, jumped, we managed to get him out and throw him out. We, we didn't care uh, how he went out. <laughs> um, yeah, our jobs were at stake. Uh, so in that trip to Darwin, uh, I was there for a month, and I'm just looking at my book, my, my records here. March 28th to April 25th is when I left. Darwin. We went out every single day except for the 4th of April. We had one day off. The Paris would only jump if there's a definite contact on. They jumped every single day uh, for, a, for a month, over a month, um, okay. except, except for one day. And there's occasions here twice a day. Twice a day, they were going into to action. Um, so that, that's how they, the war had heated up um, they felt they had always attempted to use uh, RLI troops for dispatching purposes, um, but now yeah, you know, we needed every everyone on the ground. Um, Roger, Roger um, sorry to interrupt. Um, I I've only ever been in Dakota once, and that's when I travelled on a school trip down to the sugar estates as a kid, and I remember the smell of the the plane and the the engine fuel or the fumes and then but i've read books and other discussions from guys where that became mixed with vomit and the heat and can, <laughs> can you describe some of the actual atmosphere in a plane when guys are going into a live jump 
yeah, it's it's you would you would uh, basically get the siren to go. So you would you would lay out all your shoots, have, your, have all the shoots ready. I'd go and check them. We'd go and check them over, make sure everything. You'd have a lot of stuff ready. The at, at Mount Darwin, I clearly remember that that you would get a uh, one, once you heard over the speakers, uh, Captain whatever come to the the ops room. You knew you were you were actually getting ready. Uh, then he would he would talk on the uh, radio with the OP in in that frozen area. They would they only went well when I say only I speak under correction, but nine times out of ten they went when it was a definite they had they had them in sight. The OP had them in sight. Then um, we'd go the, the choppers would go down, but the deck would circle uh, a minute or two out. So. Then the siren would go. If he decided, if the, the commander decided, right, we're going. Then the, the the guys in the helicopters in the G cars would would get in. They would taxi out, and the deck would follow just behind. We would be kitting the guys, well, helping them. They would be kitting up. Then then we would be checking and everything. And then depending on how much kit they had, they couldn't actually get in the plane themselves. You had to physically get them up those. Stairs, especially uh, when you had containers and stuff. Then, yeah. And in the plane, uh, I'll never forget. I used to have a radio with me, and that played on Radio Five a lot of the time. And I was singing uh, some of the song, song that was stuck in my head. And the one guy looked at me. He said, "How can you be so happy when I'm in the?" And I'm. And I looked at him. I said, "Yeah, yeah." And you, you also had to put a bit of 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 lay a lot of the fears but um yeah the tension the tension and obviously we were in heat uh the 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 the, the weather was 30 something degrees all the time the deck got very hot but then you had the engines blowing so it cooled down once you were taking off but you would they would put the brakes on and they would rev those engines hard and the whole thing would start bouncing and then that let the brakes go with the loads that we were carrying and um we would we would take off, and the guys they would just train their eyes on on, on us because we were talking over the radio with the, with the, the pilots, and um, their main fear was if if we shouted at them tactical drop. Tactical drop means they're going to drop you right on top of the the gangsters. A lot of the guys used to put the their, their nine mils in the straps on the reserve because of of uh, taking rounds or taking fire. Um, and they could return it. Uh, the, the jumps were always around about 450 foot, hopefully 450 feet to 500. No, never as high as, high as 500, always just under uh, sometimes. And um, they would go uh, out. Paratroopers in other countries are absolutely astounded at the heights that the guys jumped at. Um, <clears throat> I think the Americans jump at 800 feet. I might be wrong. But uh, four to 500 feet is... It's just a second or two to death, really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you don't have time. That's that's what happened with me with my uh, blown periphery. You you, you really don't have, have time. Um, I think the lowest jump that the South Africans challenged us, um, open to correction, we flew down to, to Blomfortein, <laughs> and the guys might have jumped at about 300 and something foot. Uh, but that's a, that's a one-off. There were accidents w with RAR where got it, got it wrong, and there were a couple of broken legs and stuff. No fatalities, but you can't have a broken leg when you're going into into contact. I believe um, I believe the lowest jump I read it the other day was like 290 feet. It's just incredible. Yeah, <laughs> you know, sometimes you look at a building, you you're up in a building, and it's. Yeah. Rated at that, that height, and you look and say, like, "Oh shit, that's a higher than I was jumping from." Um, but but anyway, the the the, the tension was was high, and but if the guys had been, oh, if it was bumpy, when one starts throwing up, that's it. That uh, uh, you can be sure a lot of the the others, um, and we had these these sick bags. It used to take around about a liter or more. <laughs> And I can't tell you when the, the smell, and when when you took that post and and you threw it out, yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> I played a joke on the guys one 
from day we, we were going and then they decided no no there's nothing we gotta turn around and the guy with me is uh, Greer. his father was the boss of new serum mick Greer. Um, and Greer and i decided we're gonna play this trick and we took we through the red packs and stuff we scavenged stewed prunes and and, and uh, mixed veg with carrots and peas and all so we took a sick bag we put the stuff in there and <laughs> and um stew prunes all this purple so anyway so the plan was that Greer is going to start making himself look a bit ill because again we we never we were rugged we didn't throw up at all and, and anyway but um he starts making a few faces and you just see all the all the troops they their eyes are just on him because this is this is a no no uh, next thing he takes a bag or a possumus bag and he throws where well, he pretends to throw up in there but it was our mix so when guys get sick you they, you always see what they're there <laughs> carrots and oh anyway and it was all the stuff mixed up and I was taking it to the door and I went like so I'm hungry I, hey, I put my hand in there and I just all in and I pulled out the stuff <laughs> Like that, well, that was it. We were running nonstop. The entire plane vomited, but not once, not twice. They full bags and full bags, and <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we didn't. I never ever went down that road again. Um, uh, <laughs> Tell me when. What what was the look on a guy's face as he was about to come out that door? Was it fear? Was it uh, what? What was it? What what was his face telling you? Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of fear, but. The, the one thing that I knew, that it wasn't actually the fear of engaging uh, uh, the enemy. It was actually of the jump. Because I've also felt it. You, you don't jump for, for some time. And your, your very next jump, you, you feel it. It's just like, you know, for, for whatever reason. Uh, there are a whole lot of mixed emotions. Uh, when, you, when you go up and you're that high and you look, for, for some strange reason, the higher you go, the worse I got, because I'd look down and go like, what? I'm jumping from this height. Meanwhile, I was going to die at 500 foot, and I was, I'd have a much better chance at 2,000 feet. Um, but yeah, they, they, were, they were silent, uh, sweating. It's cold, but they were sweating, uh, nervous, and uh, wanted to get on the ground and get going. That was that was their main uh, thing. Um, shame, and I, yeah, I, I sympathised with them because I did get you know experience the same things. And um, as I say, you, you 16, 16 odd troops, you, you can smell the uh, you you smell fear. Um, their faces very very uh, sullen, uh, concentrating. So. There's a thing when we run in, um, and I used to warn them, I would say to them, we run in and uh, uh, the, the pilot comes down to, to whatever height we're going to jump, they're going to jump from 500 foot or so generally, and he actually lifts the tail. And as he lifts the tail, I knew red lights coming on. I'd say to them, we're running in now. Just give them a little bit of warning, a little bit of, so it's okay, it's okay, it's, it's nice out there, we're running in now. And then it was go, 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 go. Um, and then it was a steam train out of that door so fast. Um, then then the, the shooters actually, the canopy is packed in a, in a bag. That bag's attached to the static line. So uh, you had all these bags out, out the back. And we'd have to, you, we'd have to take, two of us would have to pull them in because of the, the drag and stuff like that. And... Um, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was were, serious. Were you able to, from your position at the door, were you able to watch the initial opening part of a contact, you know, or was the Dakota getting out of there as quickly as possible? Yeah, we did, we generally never never uh, uh, hung around there. We would land. <clears throat> Unbelievably, there was amount of strips um, that the deck could land, and 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 the. Uh, Alouettes, uh close by, but with nothing around them. I mean, there was, you know, but they would land and wait. And then from, from the contact, uh, whatever happened, weapons seized, 
and uh, bodies and walking wounded were all brought back to, to that uh, uh, landing zone. And we would take over the, the, the gangsters, uh, secure them, and obviously also anyone with medical issues of, uh, of our side, uh, weapons, uh, all the AKs, the uh, SKSs, uh, rounds, backpacks, notebooks that, that they had, drawings that they've made of, of next target that they actually going to attack, and uh, yeah, get all that kind of stuff together. And then um, choppers would come and ferry all that kind of stuff back to us. And uh, then we would go go back. Uh, well, only once the, the, the operation was finished, uh, troops would, some troops would come back with us, some with the, with the uh, G-cars. K-car had, had the commander. And, um, yeah. And, Roger, so, um, <laughs> that, that raises the point. Uh, injured people, did you have any sort of medical training in your course? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> oh, geez, that, that I haven't thought of for a long time. Um, so that we paired off. We had medical courses, and then we paired off, and you had to administer all sorts of things and a drip and uh, all sorts. I mean, and those things you stuck into the vein were actually big in those days for the drip. Your hair would be... And, um, we were odd number, so I was the dummy. So they said, okay, fine, you come here. And, well, this guy, he couldn't get the drip in, and he missed this, and he missed that. And uh, I, I was in a state. You know, yeah, so, yeah, we definitely had medical uh, uh, training treatment, uh, uh, training and, and stuff like that. Uh, we had a lot of, always had a lot of, um, of, of members that needed uh, attention. Oh, Hey, that goes for medical kitting up. You know, the amount of, of, of mistakes that, that are made in the heat of the moment. Um, I was at a, a roadie reunion. I had a few guys come up to me and I didn't know who they were. They say, you saved my effing life. I'm like, huh? <laughs> what? He said, remember in, in Darwin or Grand Reef, you, I'd put my this through there and, and stuff, and you just pick that up and sort of, I would have been, if I went out the door, and it was, they would have cut, because there, there's times that um, you've got to be very, very careful of, of the reserve chute on the front of, of each each guy with a handle. If they bump that handle, the, the pilot chute shoots out the door, it's sucked out the door, and the chute goes out, and they still, uh, in the plane, and, and the static line doesn't unravel because it's it's there. And then um, yeah, then the deck stalls. It actually virtually stalls the deck, and you cut the guy away, and and hope that his main chute now opens as he drops. Uh, we had yeah, you know, look, we did have quite a no, not quite. A, we had we had numerous uh, accidents, as I say. Um, I I was actually involved at New Serum with a with a with a jump because we had a we had a trainee pilot, and he dropped us too late and dropped us from 2,000 feet. So we always begged to go higher so we could enjoy the jump a lot longer. Anyway, and in my wisdom, I took with this little Kodak Instamatic because I wanted to take photos up there, you know, really. I, I couldn't describe to people what it was like. So I thought, ah, the camera. So I was taking photos, and I thought, oh, you know, what? better put it away now. Put it away around about 1,000 foot. The next thing, I looked down and I saw Salisbury Airport runways. That's how late we were dropped. And I just said, oh, shit. And as I said, oh, shit, all over this, watch out, watch out. And I was drifting backwards into another guy's canopy. And as my uh, uh, as I went into it backwards, it folded around me. My canopy was about his, so it had a vacuum. So my canopy collapsed. I went into his. His collapsed. And I just felt this acceleration of, I just felt hot and I was scrambling there trying to get out of his canopy. And it was, yeah. And uh, we, when we really picked up speed, my canopy blew up and, and reinflated. 
and then once I was out, he's also just in time to land. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let, well, our main, well, that was our main fear over. And our next fear was if if the uh, any member of staff had seen what happened, because we would have been yeah in big trouble. We landed on Salisbury runway, and uh, a Viscount was about to take off. They were they were starting to board, and uh, the queue. And I'll never forget this old old gentleman. He left the queue, came up to us, and he, we, with all this unfolded in front of their eyes, and he just wanted to say, "You're alive." And he walked back to the queue. Wonderful. And, yeah. So, so Roger, yeah. can you? I believe you um, took special forces into Mozambique at night and that type of thing. Do you remember any of the characters that you took? Was do you ever recall meeting Shuli or anybody like that? And could you tell us about some of those um, night operations over the border and that type of thing, and what you saw and what you experienced? Yeah, yeah. We, um, my first one was from Matoko, where we were taking in a group of guys. They were were going to jump. I can't remember the free falling. But no, I don't think they were free falling. But they had we had packed for them um, these containers, and they were going to blow the uh, bridges at Tet. We we left the, the one evening, and we we had uh, low cloud and stuff, and the pilot couldn't couldn't make his way. And then the next uh, afternoon, we left around about just after five in the evening. It was still light, and we flew into uh, right up the north of Mozambique. Um, I didn't. I didn't have any any conversations with the with the guys. Uh, they were all very very quiet, and um, we came down right down to five hundred foot. Their their kit went out, as in all the the explosives that we we're going to use for the bridges, and uh, we did another circle, and then they went out. But then there was, there was a, a few numerous times where when uh, when you're back in camp. From Fire Force, you you jumped every day. You worked on all the the basic troops uh, kit and stuff like that. And I remember leaving. Used to leave just after lunch, and Flight Milligan, uh, Flight Lieutenant Milligan, he say, "Hey Finchy, come back at uh, five, eh?" And I used to, "Oh no, sir, not me tonight, man, not me." See you at five. Gosh, okay. And we used to, I used to come back, and then. Um, we would, I would pack uh, the guys. Uh, if it was SAS, then they would uh, free fall in. Uh, but then I'd pack. They used to take uh, stuff like collapsible canoes so that you put them all together. And then they would go down the rivers and, and stuff and um, and whatever extra extras they had. And I used to do their harness with with all the, and and pack all their harnesses and stuff like that, which then they hooked to their harness with a quick release kind of stuff. Um, we would go up and fly the 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 decks ceiling something around about sixteen thousand feet, and uh, it was cold up there. And we'd fly oh, many many hours right in, hadn't a clue where or anything because their briefing was very very you know. Understandable, understandable that it was very private. Uh, no one knew what they were going to do or what, whatever. They, that, but um, I remember you know, being very, very proud of them, proud of uh, the fact that I was there. And um, yeah, we'd go in and fly. And once they were gone, and, and at that temp, yeah, you know, very high deck, never had a door on it, um, so it was really cold up there. But um, uh, yeah, they they would go out and then we would do, turn and do you come remember back. remember the names of any of the guys you dispatched? Any of the top soldiers? Did you recognise any of them? No, no. Uh, scouts were many uh, 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 black guys. Oh, I remember the one. Oh, they used to complain with his free fall because he used to fall like a stone. He didn't actually fly. Um, no, but I I uh, everyone kept much to themselves, so there was not uh, no talk, no any, even in the plane, a uh, couple of hours in, no one spoke, everything was was quiet, we didn't have 
lights or anything on. And uh, I don't remember. Scully and, and, and Co, I remember when we had a register with every single jump, operational jump, uh, recorded. And, uh, you know, I remember looking, used to look there and I could, you know, I would see whenever he, he did jump and, and a few others. Um, I, I, funnily enough, did get to jump with RAR into a, a, a bit of action. Uh, we went from Shimani south um, and it, it was a Sunday. You could be sure Sundays was always a busy, busy day because um, Sunday lunchtime was beer drink for, for the crawl. And for sure, you would be called out. And um, anyway, and a group of, of, of their leaders, or commanders or whatever they called themselves, they, they were gathering together. And somehow we got info on that, flew in, and uh, we jumped. But there wasn't enough uh, RAR. So uh, they asked if I'd jump with, and I said, yep, I'm in. Um, Chap that I partnered there with, uh, it, it was it was a nice nice uh, black guy and uh, oh I forget his name now, but but coming down uh, I bumped into his shoot or we bumped in our canopies together, uh, but luckily they just sprung apart. Um, but when he landed he broke the radio, the the cord going into the the set, uh, so we had no radio, um, and. Uh, they they really gave us a hammering because they they were in a, a outcrop of rocks, not a copy but a a, a big big out, outcrop of rocks, and we unfortunately we didn't have have uh, too much comms, um, but as we landed there was just rounds flying everywhere. Uh, only oh that that session was a good two to three hour firefight, but. Uh, very early on, after around about 30, 35 minutes, uh, I heard this this whistling and I looked up uh, and there were two hunters. And I just said, whoa, <laughs> you know, you know what's going to happen now? And the first hunter went up onto the onto its perch and then into the dive and he dropped a, a thousand pound uh, golf bomb. Now a thousand pound of golf, he would come out on a chute, uh, he'd come down very slowly, by parachute, and then a, a, a probe would drop out the, the bottom of it. I'm not sure the, the length of the probe. So the, the golf bomb would go off before it actually. So meth, this really destructed, uh, caused a lot of destruction. Uh, and I looked at that thousand pounder and it was coming down so slowly. And we were hiding. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was only a log. <laughs> but to me, that uh, I felt safe, <laughs> but until that thing went off. Um, Lynxes with the friend the 10 bombs, they used to have a thousand liter one and a, a 500 liter, and the fire des devastation that that caused. But yeah, and then the Gulf really uh, flattened anything around other than, other than the rocks. Trees, I mean, that thing flattened a, a, a small amount of forest. And um, yeah, we were in there, uh, had a, a uh, I think it was four kills and a few captures. And uh, very, one very, of the... Very expensive, very expensive killing the enemy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but I think it was worth it because they were all leaders. They, you know, the kind of uh, information that came back uh, uh, out of their backpacks, the drawings that they made, the, the, all the info... Um, I, I remember smiling at the, at the one uh, uh, letter the one had written to the, the guy I had his backpack um, that he had carried that carried all these mines into to Rhodesia, but he forgot the detonators. And he was saying, "Hey, comrade, please, go. can you help me out with a couple of de de detonators?" And I laughed at that. They carried these things forever, and they were big mines. And um, yeah, and he forgot that. Uh, I saw a, a yet a nice. A, a, a uh, brown denim denim type of Russian shirt, which I thought, no, that 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 that's mine. And uh, when we got back to to camp, I had that thing washed for a week or so to try and get rid of the smell. Um, more than a week, every single day. Uh, and funny enough, when I went for my first job interview in in South Africa, I wore that shirt. <laughs> 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 Embarrassing now, but in fact, I think I still got got it. 